Okay. <clears throat> well, welcome everyone to PAS Presents here on Wednesday, May 6th. Uh, this is a live series created by the Progressive Arts Society. Uh, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Julie Davila. I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I currently serve as your second vice president for the Progressive Arts Society. And I'm happy to host today the one and only, the Miss Fabulous, uh, Shi Yi Wu. So welcome, Shi Yi. Hi, Julie. It's great to see you, my friend. You look great. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, just for the public, if you have any questions at all during this live video, just make sure to post some comments um, below. And we will try to get to as many of those questions as possible today. Um, after we're done, this video will be saved on the PAS Facebook page, as well as the PAS YouTube channel. Um, you will also be able to find uh, past PAS Presents videos at our website at PAS.org underneath resources. So we've had a million tremendous or a lot of tremendous sessions so far these last few months. So we hope that you'll check those resources out. Uh, in any regard, let's welcome Shi Yi Wu to our, uh, our series here, and uh, we're looking forward to today. So Shi Yi, tell us uh, how you're doing. How's things been going during this uh, last couple months for you? Good question. I think, like everybody, um, for all the artists that I know, suddenly have your entire calendar wiped out. And uh, I, I used to fly, what, 250,000, quarter of a million miles a year. Um, I have, um, have nothing for the next, I don't know, four or five months or something. I think my first concert actually was <clears throat> in October in outside of Nashville. Hopefully uh, that will happen. Um, I think everybody deals with uh, the pandemic differently. Uh, some people I can see that very uh, channeling their energy into making videos and, and doing all sorts of things and composing. And uh, some people are trying to just sort of sit back and think a little bit. Uh, I have been, I mean, all my March concerts and April concerts, especially like I was supposed to go to Paris and London and Budapest and like, a lot of concertos, um, performances, uh, are gone and so sure. i would um to be very honest i was a little sort of shocked and had to kind of get used to this is the new reality and uh i've been channeling pretty much all my energy to teaching because northwestern actually it's a quarter system uh mm. school, and so it goes to like the beginning of june so i still have actually five more weeks of teaching so they have they have become, my students have become sort of like the prime, like the focus in my everyday life, other than thinking and reading and doing some cooking. <laughs> and where are you right now? Can you tell us where where you're shooting from? Are you in your office at uh, Northwestern or? Um, I am. Hmm? I, uh, I am in my office uh, at Northwestern. Uh, uh, the school realized that I cannot move all the instruments to my little apartment on the third floor mm. uh, so they, they were very supportive of me uh, so I actually come to this huge building uh, by myself there's no one else here and I'm very isolated for sure um, yeah they disinfect every every room and every day when I come in there's a tape it means I've been here so oh wow well we have to take every precaution right now that's for sure so and we hope that this is, while it will take a while, uh, we hope that it'll be temporary in the whole scope of life. Um, so I'm sure we're gonna at some point get you back out there on the concert series and there's hope. We gotta have hope for sure. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, just, you know, your start, Chi. I'd, I'd love for you to share with the audience here a little bit about, I know a little bit about it, but maybe you could share. I know a lot of people, I was kind of a two-part question. A lot of people know you as this super fabulous marimbas, but you're an all-around terrific percussionist. And I know that at some point in one of our conversations, you mentioned that you started out with a, your interest in timpani. 
So maybe you could talk just a little bit about your 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 formative years, your early days, and and some of that path, and possibly how that that um, you know created your interest to come to the states and study, and just a little bit of background. Um, that's a complicated story, although simple. I I I didn't grow up in a musical family. Um, my my parents couldn't really. Uh, they don't read music, they don't understand uh, much of it. But my mother um, has always been a classical lover, classical music lover, especially brass uh, music. Hmm. So I, I grew up listening to a lot of that. But I think that because my mother could not, um, didn't have uh, access to learn music, and so she wanted to make sure that her children could do that, even though mm -hmm. we couldn't afford it. And so when I was little, to be precise, about three and a half years old, um, we were walking and we walked by a music store and um, there were a lot of kids in there, a lot of instruments, drums and pianos and all sorts of things. And, and then so I, I, my face apparently was like stuck to, to the, the glass door because I couldn't, I was so drawn to it, the sound. And so my mother said, of course, you know, do you want to go in? you know, big eyes probably at that time because I was sure. little. And then I like ran into the door and that pretty much sums it up because I couldn't leave. I didn't want I want to leave. I refused to leave. And I was hugging the piano leg and my mother was like, we have to go, we have to go. Anyhow, the lady came out um, and said that, well, um, how old is she? And, you know, and my mother said, oh, she's three and a half, you know. And then she said, well, we have a class starts, you know, for, for children, they're age of four. Well, my mother is like, oh, she's three and a half, you know. So the, <laughs> they, they didn't want me to do that because she probably was thinking about the financial, sure. financial part of it. Anyhow, uh, this lady said, well, just bring her. We won't charge you. We won't charge her. Wow. Just bring her. And then I thought, and I was looking at them, probably didn't understand too much about what that meant. Anyhow, I, I started going to those music classes, and it was, um, it was a blast. I, I mean, I was learning all sorts of instruments. Anyhow, and then I started playing piano, because my mother thought it was important, and I really was uh, enjoying it. And then this is when it took the turn. When I was six, my mother really wanted me to play French horn. Mm. So she arranged for a lesson. Um she was so excited. I could tell from her face, today is the day. And then I was right. like, okay. Anyway, she took me to the French horn lesson. And uh, I, I, I was, after the, an hour spit and all that, I, I just couldn't make any sound, <laughs> literally. Well, you kind of would understand that because I can't swim. I have breathing issues. Like I, oh, okay. I'm careful in the shower because I'm breathing water. I just can't. I, I have trouble doing that. <laughs> so uh, she she took me home and she was like, I'm pretty disappointed. But she said, well, if you can't play French horn, is there something else you would like to learn? Um, and my brother at that time, you know, was uh, studying violin. So I uh, I said, no violin. <laughs> so I, of course not. Are you kidding me? So I said, well, what about the drums in the back in the orchestra? And my mother's like, you don't even know where they're. So I said, no, they're timpani. Anyhow, there's, hmm. a, there's the beginning and the end of my path on percussion. And from that point on, I, I, you know, I studied snare drum. I, actually, I played timpani for a long time before I even touched anything else. Um, I obviously didn't have the means to have drums, but I practiced on the sure. couch all the time uh, that was my instrument um and then i went to the snare drum i loved the snare drum and uh xylophone and and two mala marimba it's not until <clears throat> and it's the truth it's not until i was 17 i i did not play four mallets until i was 17 like just before i went to college right and that's the truth well that's that's inspirational, really, to think of what you've done starting at 17 with mallets. But so when you were studying piano at the school, did you have access to an instrument at home to practice or? Not, not in the beginning. Right. But, but later into it, my mm -hmm. mother did, uh, took out a loan. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But a, a little piano, yeah. Sure. When I was thinking about what you said about you practice timpani on the couch, you know, and think about the situation we're in right now. There's a lot of students that 
we just have to find ways, you know, to create resources for ourselves to stay moving forward. So it's not and much different. The, and same as the marimba. I didn't, <clears throat> I didn't, I didn't own a marimba until I endorsed one. I never, I never owned a marimba. I always practiced at school or at home on mm -hmm. a carpet. Or if you, you have, you have, if you had gone to North Texas, you would know floor practices, floor exercises. This is part of the things that we have to do and practice on the floor, and as if that's your marimba and work on your chops. And and I did that too, and sure. I found it extremely helpful. Super valuable, yeah. Go mean green, yeah. <laughs> Um, so then let's, let's go, let's, let's jump ahead then post North Texas days, take us through a little bit of the timeline. You graduate from North Texas. Is that straight to Rutgers then? I uh, graduated from North Texas and, you know, it's very interesting. Um, I remember one of those uh, rehearsals, I was uh, about to graduate as a master's student and, and my teacher, your teacher, Bob Shuchoma said, you know what, <clears throat> there is a, should I imitate him? Because he spoke very slowly. Sure. And very quietly. We only have 40 minutes. Like, she, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> he, uh, he, he said, there, basically, there was a job open in West Virginia University. And then I kind of looked at him, I said, okay. And he said, are you interested? And I said, no. It was that quick. I said, no, I'm not interested. I just want to play. I wanted to play. I wanted to play. Teaching mm -hmm. was not in my horizon at all. I was, I did not consider that. Um, so after, after that conversation was very brief, so he let me go. He was kind of surprised, but he let me go. I went back to the rehearsal and then I asked my friends, hey, do you know uh, West Virginia University? Is that the western part of Virginia? And then they were all laughing. <laughs> they were like, no, she is a state. And I said, I know, I know. Anyhow, they told me about it. And then um, and then one of my friends, dear friends, uh, John Kellis, who used to be the head of the steel band at, at North Texas, he said, you should check it out. And then I said, y you think so? He goes, yeah. And, uh, seriously, it's because of he said that. I said, oh. Okay. He goes, you might not get it. <laughs> so I did. I went back to my teacher and I said, okay, I, I'll, I'll apply. What do I have to do? So he just printed out something and then he gave it to me. And then I applied and I did get the job and I started teaching. Uh, but then after that, I interviewed for Rutgers University. I was there for a decade. And then now I, I've been at Northwestern for hard to believe I'm finishing my 12th year. Wow. That yeah. is hard to believe. That went. That's gone really fast. Yeah. Wow. So, so I, I, had... I end up. So I, I basically end up doing something that I said I wasn't interested at all. I wasn't going to do. I never thought about that. And then, and and then I can see my life. Uh, the it's the ratio is changing. Mm -hmm. And and it's maybe because, um, I had such amazing teachers. I had Bob Shatroma, I have Ed Sove, and 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 um, and then I. Later on, when I was at Rutgers, I taught with Alan Abel, and, and the way they, um, the legacy is really in their students. And these three people almost don't talk about themselves much. They Correct. all have one thing in common. They talk about music, they talk about their students, um, and, and they think about their students, and, and they don't think about themselves, talk about themselves much. That's very inspiring to me. Um, I never thought that I was going to have anything to do with teaching. And here I am that I've been teaching for 20 some years. Yeah. And, and I, that's uh, been a very important part of my life has been, has become actually. And then I, I, I think teaching is a noble calling. It's not for everybody. Right. Absolutely. If you, and if you feel that, that calling and the draw, um, that means, it means something. It's a, and when I, I recognize one, a mentor who is uh, selfless, it, it's extremely inspiring. Absolutely. So we have a question uh, from Carter, and he said, "You said music teaching was not on your horizon at all. What career was on your horizon? So when you didn't see yourself going into teaching, what were your aspirations at that time? Was it strictly performing?" I. I 
I wanted to be a touring musician since I was, I don't know, little. I, after I started playing timpani, I really wanted to play. And then I wanted to travel. I, I wanted to see the world, wanted to play. And I, that's all I wanted to do. And I did do that while I was starting to teach, too, at the same time. Sure. Well, I would say now you have kind of the best of both worlds, right? I mean, <laughs> I feel like I have five or six jobs sometimes. Right. Well, right? and I, don't you feel like that's kind of where that this is going anyway, to sort of be a musician in today's world? If we're very entrepreneurial and, and have to wear five different hats to create one sort of career. And maybe that is a good segue into one of my questions about maybe what are some of your, um, kind of takeaways or conversations you have with your current students about, uh, you know, just about their training, just the, sort of this next generation. What do you, what do you, what are the messages that we're, we need to, you know, in, empower these students with how to have this career in, in music or in percussion in general? The sky is uh, not even the limit in my opinion. And sometimes when I, when I first meet a, a, a student, and to be honest, none of us, right, both sides, really knows what the full potential this, this person has. And you know how I would have to figure it out? I'll have to push ahead, and then they will be, have to be willing to come with me. And then we have to meet somewhere. And because m m my bar is like, continue to go up and up. And then you, you can play this great. Now, this, can you do it like this? Can you do it faster? Can you play like this? Can you play, play this phrase like this? Can you try this approach? Can you try to change the touch? I mean, just immediately, bam, 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 right? And so, so I, I really don't know their potential, nor do they. Sure. The students, and especially when they're 18, it's tremendous. I mean, sometimes I, I look back and like, wow, look at what you have done this whole year. My goodness, mm -hmm. do you think that you would have come this far? They, most of them said, no, I, I, can't, I can't believe I could play that because a year ago I couldn't. Just imagine that. And so I, I felt the same way. I feel about this, that about the same way about the career. It's, an, it's, it's not a defined career. It, what you just said about it. everybody's wearing five hats. My is a, a choice, though. I really enjoy composing. I minor in composition uh, during my master's degree. I really enjoy composing. I now really enjoy teaching. It's a part that I will never, never, mm -hmm. never let go. And and then I, I love designing instruments. I like the musical acoustic side of it. Um, the malice and the, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's fun. And so I would I would hope our next generation, if you may, um, they will think really wide open. It's like, oh, all right, I'm not just going to compete and then win this competition, then what? No, you carve out a package, a, a, a unique path for yourself. And if there is any more appropriate time to say this, is now. You don't, Absolutely. You, don't, you don't even have instruments. So what are you going to do? It make, make, makes me think... Well, if you really want to do this, maybe you ought to try to see if you can somehow write a grant or get an instrument and all sorts of things and, and then and carve out some kind of performing opportunities when, when all the orders are lifted and when we're back to somewhat quasi-normal. Um, sure. You know, carve out and then educational opportunities and, and so forth. Um, compositionally, uh, playing chamber music and, and music industry. That's a huge part too. And I think, I think the next generation have to be creative. Like everything about it, it's interesting. Right. And, and it would be really great. And then it would not do them uh, a service to say, you should just focus on this. Well, I, I don't know if I would, if I were them now, when, if I were 18 again, I would dual degree in business. That's what mm. I would do. I would love Absolutely. to do that. And, and music or, or... Entrepreneurship? <laughs> yes. And then go into, you know, medicine or completely differently. But then also, you know, music cognition mm. and uh, uh, neuroscience and how does that impact humans, how they learn and listen to music and all that. It's so much overlap. And, and then it's... 
it's this is the time to be creative. Absolutely. Well, I mean, uh, that was, that's what's exciting and as a draw to me for music is that we have no borders, really. You know, we we just have we can zig and zag and 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 just be creative. And what a great time to be creative right now uh, and to prepare. I think this is a great time to compose and to prepare even through practicing, prepare lit for those performances once um, things open back up. But right. hey, so we have a couple questions. Uh, Gilbert Garcia. Hey, Gilbert. How you doing? Glad to see you on. Uh, he said, were you a natural when you picked up the, the mallets at 17 or was that a difficult task for you in terms of your craft? Were, did you feel like you had a lot of natural skills coming from piano? I'm, I'm elaborating here. Or did you just really have to shed and shed and shed? I assume you want to know the truth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got to tell you, play, being able to play piano only helps you one thing, read, right? You can right. be a little faster than normal people uh, that they haven't been able to, you know, uh, exposed to piano or reading music. Other than that, the playing feel is level. Mm -hmm. So I have the same physical issues that I have to learn how to do all this like everybody else. You know, the secret is I practice a lot. I think about music a lot. I think about every note. I think about every marking on that piece of music that's white and it is like a lot of black dots with a lot of sure. stuff around it. I, I how do you how do you keep that? Uh, uh, I know I've I've I know your travel schedule in this last few years, and you know between teaching and being on an airplane and flying all over the world, how do you find that time to? To practice and prepare is there a lot of are you are you looking at the music on the airplane or you know it's hard it's hard when your schedule becomes that um immense to even find the time to prepare for those things and you've always just blown me away with like oh i'm playing this piece i and i i haven't looked at it yet i remember a couple of years ago when you were playing PASIC, it, we were like six weeks out and you're like what should i play at PASIC? i'm not i i haven't decided yet we're like you just learn music so quickly. That's just so amazing that you can be six weeks out you, from a major what, performance. That's what you think, right? I gave you the impression of that, but <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if that's true because I am. I really think about music a lot. So if I think about music all the time, like this morning, I woke up thinking about certain pieces that my students are playing, and I think about them so much that it's in my dream. This mm. is how much this has impacted me. I think about the music they're playing. And, and I do, I practice. Uh, this, I'm very efficient that way. I practice on the plane. I practice anywhere at the airport, sitting there and just looking at the music or sometimes just thinking about the music, not looking. And sometimes I'm sure. just listening to, uh, one time, you will find this hilarious. I'm listening to the metronome, headphone, metronome. Ding, 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 like that. Because, and I'm looking at my music to make sure that my, intuition is is really subdivision really is with metronome and then somehow this the core got tangled up and fell off so we go ding 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 everybody <laughs> is listening to this and then i was like trying to stop it because everybody's looking at me and then my the person who's sitting next to me said that's what you've been listening to the entire time <laughs> and then i said yep it's called practicing i'm a musician that's great. So That's there hilarious. you have it. So I have to go through the same thing. I'm not a natural by any means. I just I just practice physically a lot when I was in school. I practice a lot mentally all the time. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, we have a couple more questions. Uh, someone asked, um, let me see if I can find it. Oh, BJ Stinson. Thanks for joining, BJ. What are your favorite, Shi'i, what are your favorite books for keyboard pedagogy? Or do you have any that you would recommend? Well, Julie has a book. Thank you. Um, or just resources that you use, maybe. Just mention a few resources you use with your students, whether that's I, I besides. Own, I own basically all of them. If you would ask my students, I, I teach pedagogy every year, uh, every other year. And every other year is literature repertoire class. But I, I talk about every single book that I can get my hands on. 
So I don't have a favorite one. You know, my favorite one is if I had to answer, it's like <clears throat> combine them. Right. And then sometimes I just start the teaching like the way I feel like I I need to get my points across. And then I have it in my head and not necessarily a particular book that I use mm-hmm. at all. But sure. um, I, I, I take them through my progression. Nice. And, which is consist of a lot of books. Yeah. Sure. I feel like that's just with about any instrument I find. You know, we're always using the books as supplemental material, but there's not one method. It's a lot. Um, well, so what do you, uh, another question we have, someone asked uh, about a, your solo piece, Blue Identity. Yes. So they found a piece, Blue Identity, and wanted to know when the ensemble version of that would be available. Ah, it said, yeah, so this is Miles Thomas. You have a piece I saw live called Blue Identity. The solo version is published, but not the ensemble version that you have played live. Miles, good news. It's been published, I think, since last November. Uh, um, it's by the same publisher, which escaped me for the second at the moment. We'll get uh, our fact check on that. Space. There. Tap space. And... Um, and so it's, it's both published, and it's a. I'm gonna talk for a second about it. I, I wrote the uh, piece uh, for the uh, Frederick Macarez's uh, percussion ensemble from uh, one of the Paris conservatories, um, regional, and they were playing a PASIC, and he asked me to write them a piece and play with them, and I consider that as an honor. Um, I took that to heart, and I was thinking about it a lot that summer. And on my train, on my train ride from Paris to Nancy, which is a town in east part of uh, France, um, I I start to jog down on some of those things. And and the reason why it's called Blue Identity because I really like movies. And at that time, it was like you know I was watching Born Identity. It's like crashing into things and the helicopter and all that chase ride, and I, it was very cool. And actually, all the Born right. And so I I wanted to write something explosive like that, but um, I was feeling quite blue at that time. So I combined the two, it becomes Blue Identity. So there's a solo version and there's also the ensemble version. And there's a recording of uh, it uh, with um, a Finnish percussion group, Osuma. That's been recorded and released about a year ago. Nice. Nice. So uh, we've got a few qu- a few times this question has come up. When is your next album coming out? Ha, ha, ha. Post-quarantine? <laughs> very good, Steve. Very good, very good. Um, I guess I'll just come out and really tell the truth. I've been trying to uh, record the Bach cello suites for something like uh, close to 10 years. So about 10 years ago, I made a, 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 you know, in a beautiful hall, recording engineer, the whole bit. I spent two and three days or something, work on it and recording it. And then it happened. And uh, it sat there for a little bit because I was kind of busy. But it sat there. And by the time I went back to listen to it, which is about six months later or so, it wasn't me anymore. Mm. I didn't feel like it was me anymore and it did not represent me. So I abandoned that project. All that work. Wow. And the finances that goes with it. I just, no, that's not me. So then five years later, I did that again. I thought I was ready. I said, okay, she, like last time, come on. This time, come on, you can do this. So I did it again. Guess what? The same thing happened. So the, 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 I guess the moral story is like when you record something, just get it out. Because otherwise you listen to it and you just find all sorts of faults and what you don't like and just retard. No, it's not enough space. And it's not... Anyhow, I, call me crazy. I abandoned that again. So now it's now into like a very, you know, the chicken, chicken, you know, the. the right. So, <laughs> so about a year and a half ago or something like that, I finally recorded them. This time, I didn't want to listen to it. Nice. I listened to 
very little just to listen to the sound. And guess what? I have news for you, Steve. It's coming out in about, I don't know, 12 days, 14 days. This wow. May, like in a couple of weeks. And you can get it on Spotify or iTunes or all sorts of things. And this time, I am releasing it. So, Julia, you're like smiling. It's like, oh, man, this, you know, she's crazy, but this is really crazy. Guess what? A, a really good cellist. His name is uh, Peter Wisp, uh, Wispaway, but Wispaway is Dutch, so you spell it differently. But he recorded three times. One is when he was like almost like a student, just graduated, and he was just at the beginning of his career. And then, like, 12 years later, and then he came out with another one just like a few years ago. Why mm -hmm. do you think they do that? Because you grow, and mm -hmm. they no longer sound right to you, and you don't want to live with that. Except he had, you know, recording companies like force him to, no, you got to release it, and then they release it. But he had to do it three times, too. You just don't see the first two times, but yeah. But don't you think that's a? I, I love this story because I think we live in in a, in this particular generation right now that that wants to put everything out on on social media quickly, you know. And and maybe we need to make sure it's what we want out there because it's out there forever. So I think that's a terrific lesson, for sure. What are some? Um, Inspir what are your inspirations right now? Who inspires you? What inspires you? Uh, where do you find your inspiration? Just in general, not necessarily during this time, but just in general. Do you read, you know, other composers that you listen to, maybe even some other favorite composers? I read all sorts of things, different things. Uh, I read Bible too. Um, I read music cognition related, uh, brain related, uh, learning about learning. I, I am very interested in that kind of subject. Um, I read performance practice, I, I, that kind of things. Um, sure. About athletes. My inspiration, it comes down to a few things. Like I, I mentioned that earlier, um, uh, Alan Abel, who we lost over coronavirus mm -hmm. a week ago or so, um, people like him or Bob Shutroma, people like that continue to inspire me. And 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 to be honest, if it weren't for my teacher, my mentor, I I wouldn't have the work ethic that I have. I wouldn't mm. music so seriously everything so seriously and and I was also thinking about Bach just now we were talking about Bach's recording uh, um, Bach's cello suites you know a lot of close friends think that I'm a I might be sort of borderline workaholics before the pandemics and I think about that a lot. And a really close friends will say, hey, you should probably slow down, you know, because you're not sleeping very much. And and if you ask my teacher, sleep when you're dead, you know, that's on my, <laughs> on my door, obviously. Right? You know, sleep is for the week. No, 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 you got to sleep. But everybody needs different kind of amount of sleep, right? Sure. So seriously. And and so it's, it's uh, different for everybody. But for example, we'll talk about Bach for a second. You know what he was doing just before he died? He was messing around correcting this little chorale that he was writing. He was about to die. That's what he was doing. And now you can look at that and go, well, you know, he's a war garlic. Maybe not. Maybe because he wrote every note for, for God. And that was very important to him. And he wanted to make it perfect. He wanted to make it sound as good as he could. And that's what he was doing. So is that, it, you can call him workaholic. Oh right. uh, man, you can't take the music with you. But you know what? He left us a lot of music. And nobody can take away from that. Absolutely. So it, uh, every, sort of everything has too many sides to it, I suppose. And I, I get inspired. I get motivation, motivated by people like that. 
people that are very devoted to something they want to give, something they they believe in. Um, whether it's education, whether it's playing, whether it's making the research, you know, for for something material, engineering, people like that, and trying to find some some way so they could help people to the the, the women that don't the uterus, you know, that can't have children mm -hmm. to have that. Can you believe that the material engineering, and and I get inspired by people like that. Any field. It's just the fact that, that they wanted to give more. They they want to help. They they really take what they do extremely seriously and, and take it to a, a level that that one can imagine. Yeah. I get inspired by that. Well, I think that's uh it is inspirational to think about all the different people in the world and all the giftings. You know, all the different giftings and we hope that you know, like you said with Bach, and you know, maybe he didn't see it as work. That's why he was doing it till the end. You know, it was just his passion. His I got to get up. It's like not. Right, I, this not. is what makes me. This is what, what why I get up every day. You know, this is what makes me breathe. So, uh, yeah, fantastic, awesome, awesome. Okay, so I'm going to ask. Uh, Way has a question. Hi, Way. Nice to see you. Uh, he said, what's the biggest piece of business advice you would offer for today's modern musician and artist that you share with your students or apply to your own work? Any specific practical examples of how you apply this advice? We spoke a little bit earlier about this next generation, but any, any business advice, the professionalism maybe aspect of what we have to shape as well in the students? Yeah, it's, uh, it's two things, if I may. One is uh, flexibility, the ability to adapt. This goes from every level, right? This applies to uh, being a musician playing in a chamber music setting. It's, the winds are playing this way. And so in order to play with them, you have to adapt. You have to change on the spot. You have to be aware, extremely observant musically and also physically. Uh, if you're a soloist, uh, you're playing with orchestra, you're playing with uh, uh, any ensembles, you have to make it, make it work. You have to adapt on that spot. Same thing goes with even if you're taking an audition for military bands or, or orchestras, they want you to be flexible. And so, so and also in business, I'm a faculty, right? I, I, I have to be, I have to work with a lot of other people and I have to be flexible. I have to agree to disagree. Mm -hmm. So being, uh, being flexible, I think on many levels is extremely important. And some people go, no, no, this is the way I, you know, this is the who I am and this is the way I'm going to play. Well, okay, then maybe you should be a soloist. But then you feel that way, nobody's going to play with you either. <laughs> you can't be a soloist either, or with, at least with any ensemble. And so that the ability to let me being flexible is a huge one. As a person, as a colleague, as a musician, as a business person, you have to, do, have to learn how to adapt very quickly. Especially, I mean, look at now. I, sure. I... I I think that's important. Second is uh, being curious, the curiosity part of it. Absolutely. If one has that, um, you can do a lot of things. I'm just, I'm just imagine this. I'm gonna say something crazy. Like, I wonder if I could fly. If I could make something fly. And this is like how many years ago now? Right. Well, I wonder if I could, if I could, if I could find, you know, invent something that I could see the pictures, you know, on this box, in this box. I wonder if we could talk by connection, some kind of tube or some some kind of connection. Just, just the curiosity. So it's the same as like, I wonder, I wonder how I should play that note. And you know, what if I play this note like this? What if I play that note like that? What if I play that note like this? Like, what would it sound like? And if I played it just a little, like the placement just a little differently, how about if I just think about my gesture differently? How about if I think about, I mean, you can go nuts. 
<laughs> so curiosity is is really a, a, also a very important part of um, being a musician or just being a human. I mean, you can yeah. I'm curious about how somebody would train for hundred meters for Olympics. I mm -hmm. wonder what that would take. I, I I don't. I wonder what that would mean and how fast the the jaw is gonna have to move and all that. Like, I wonder like what kind of coaching that is. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's all curiosity. Absolutely. I, well, I think curiosity just is keeps us growing always. If you're curious, you're not going to just stay stagnant. So that's a great answer. And, you know, Mike Bird actually gave that same answer in his uh, PAS Presents when he was asked, what, do, what does he look for in students? And curiosity was one of his answers as well. Um, so is that something that you look for in your students? Like maybe speak a few minutes and then I'll take a few more questions. I've got a few here in the queue to get to yet. So hang in there, everybody. We'll get to <laughs> some of those questions. But maybe segue into a, a, a few attributes that you look for when you're auditioning students for, uh, for, for Northwestern. And uh, it, I could probably tag... Uh, Matt's question on that, what do you consider great audition pieces? So that doesn't have to go hand in hand, but maybe what you look for in some students and then speak a little bit about like, you know, when they come in for an audition, what are some things that from a lit standpoint or is any, what things are important? I think, uh, I think be, being well-rounded is extremely uh, important. I think every one of us uh, from any university is looking for that. And to be honest, if you're going to call yourself a percussionist, you can't play snare drum, you can play marimba very well. That is not a percussionist, in my opinion. 100%. Um, and and I, I, I would take somebody who can play snare drum and can't read very well over somebody who plays marimba really well and can't play snare drum. Because snare drum, in my opinion, is the foundation of percussion. Um, so well-roundedness is extremely important. Two, uh, if you, if I may be specific, uh, sure. for, for Northwestern, um, the academic interest and curiosity is it's a requirement. And if sure. they're not interested in what the, a, a university like Northwestern has to offer, then they're missing out a lot. And mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm looking for somebody who is has why. Uh, levels of interest and also well-rounded in percussion and very open-minded nice because if you're there open-minded i mean they could take anything flexible curious all that awesome. and so I, I i i mean uh audition pieces is sort of um i always put it in this way you want to you want to choose something that best describe you represent you as a musician and as a percussionist, both. Because in, in an audition, we do want to see a little bit of technique. So, mm -hmm. so if you play something extremely musical and it's really slow, chorale, and nothing shows any of your technique, that's at some point you have to show a little bit of that mm -hmm. and your hands. And um, but I do think that some some people pick something really really difficult and they play it poorly. I wouldn't recommend that. I think mm -hmm. that. Best describe them, portray them, represent them as a musician. That would be the perfect piece. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so a couple more questions. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna combine a few again. So I had a question about uh, from Ryan. Uh, what is your process when you're learning a new piece? And I'm gonna have a part two on that. That. I don't know if these completely go together, but we'll try. Jeremy says, what frustrates you most in your playing or teaching? But let's start with what's your process, learning a new piece? Uh oh, do you have two hours? <laughs> Break it down a few bullet points. <laughs> so do you have two hours? Because <laughs> it will take me that long to talk about them. I have a, I have a lecture about it, about how to learn uh, something new. It's in five stages, and I'll just talk briefly because we don't have two hours uh, just sure. for the subject. So stage one is you. It's all about gut reaction. It's 
seriously, it's it's looking at the music. Don't play anything. Don't go to the drum. Don't go do anything. No, just sit down with your coffee or tea or whatever it is that you that you makes you hydrate, I suppose, because it would it it will you um, <laughs> it will require that um just to get a reaction of what music looks like. As as a musician, just like wow, this starts like this, and it goes into this section, it goes like this, and it goes into transition into this, and then at this section, okay, cool. It's as if you like browse through like a book really quickly, mm-hmm. okay. So you can close the book, and guess what? You can sort of tell me the story. Sort of goes like this, but I don't know the details. But it kind of goes from here, you know, the uh, this so and so meets so and so, and this and this happened, and this happened. And so if you cannot look at the music with the, before even going to the practice room and do all that and then close it and say, I can tell you all about this piece of music, but I can't play a note. I would be so happy. I will have to go get firecrackers and fireworks, <laughs> you know, because, because that is most important because you get the big picture. Sure. You know what you're about to get yourself into. And then the second uh, stage is, it's about analytical. It's 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 all about the analysis. Physically, what do you need? Technically, and mm-hmm. then what is this composer about? What is the style? What's the period? When was the piece written? What does it require for me to do this? And what does this trail mean? So how do I play this? All the an- analysis that you have to do, uh, motivic analysis, harmonic analysis, rhythmic, all that. So this is the brain side, right? So mm-hmm. the first one is the gut side. And then the second stage is about the intellectual understanding of the piece. And once you do that, you will realize what you need to practice. No? <laughs> right. So the third stage, the third stage is actually you have to do the actual physical practicing coupled with your intellectual understanding and your, your gut reaction of the piece. So you are learning something, but you know what it comes that with. It's not just the note itself that is meaningless. It's the note with this is this section. It goes like this. So I should practice learning these notes, but with these feeling inside. And then the next section is uh, next stage. Uh, it's called the incubation period. You you learned it. You can play it. Does not mean you should play it. <laughs> you should let it sit and then I talk about this often it's like does your mom make the chicken soup and put the chicken in there and then there's some broth and then and, and you know celery carrots and then like serve it to you no it has to be cooked right otherwise it would not get all the flavor and so it's the incubation period right and then and then the next one is the, the exploration or near the end <laughs> which allows you, you have now the technique to do everything, you understand a piece, but then now it's the you, because you know everything about this piece. Feel it, hands, mm-hmm. all that, great. Now it's about you. What can you bring to this? You can do everything that's written for, that's great, but what can you bring that's unique, yours? And that can only be done uh, by exploring all different options, all different possibilities, musical possibilities, color possibilities, and so sound possibilities. And so that's extremely important. Most people just skip over. I learned it, I'm, I can play, I'm play. Yeah, I think most students, like they learn what's on the page. They don't think about taking that next step of nuancing in their own voice. And then the last uh, stage after you explore, you know, you, you're on a bike, you go like, I wonder what, What's down there? And then you go and then you find out, like, oh, that's a dead end, you know, that kind of <laughs> thing. And then so by the end of that stage, uh, you would explore, you analyze, you practice, you know what this piece is, and you make some musical decisions as of your own. Then the last stage is just execution. Start with the E. Ex- exploration, execution, incubation, all that. But uh, the last one is, to me, if you had done one, two, three, four, all the stages before that, execution is not an issue. Just do it. It's the Nike slogan. Right. Just do it. Some students of mine will be like at an audition or competitions. You know, I'm about to play. I said, just play it the way you practice. 
not faster, not louder, not softer, not... F and no, just like the way you practice. You know why? That's what the Olympic diving team does. You think they're standing up there and going like, you know what? I think I'm going to jump a lot higher than how I, my coach <laughs> is telling me. No! You just execute, right? So that's how I learned a piece. Sorry, it's just like two hours packed into... There you have it, that's folks. Up. I hope you're taking notes. Three minutes. Sorry. Yeah, great stuff. Well, what was the next question? I forgot about it already. Oh, me as well, maybe. Uh, what what frustrates you? Is there any, in that, and maybe in that process, or were either you when you're preparing for a concert or performance, or or you're preparing your t your students, uh, anything that maybe comes to mind. Um, what frustrates me the most in my playing is my hands never can catch up with my brain mm. or how my heart feels. Um, I was talking just about that this morning, about a piece, and I was having this discussion. And then, to me, that's what frustrating. Do, do you know how many people that really want to break Guinness records or Olympic records and all that. But you, you know why that when they break it, it's break by the microseconds. It's like 9.872, you know, and then that was 9.87. Wow, okay. <laughs> it is a record and I should admire that. But at the same time, do you know why it's not five seconds? Because humans can't. We have our limitations on earth and eventually this is gonna go too. And so everything is gonna go. And so, so, I, I get frustrated that I can't sometimes play exactly the way that I imagined. And, and that music is exists in my brain, like in my head, inside of me. And no one can hear it except me. And I'm, I'm just a vessel. I literally just trying to execute whatever's inside of me out, right? That's mm -hmm. what a musician, a musician does. Convey, express. And so I think... I'm just going to have to live with it. Just like those people that, that run 100 meters, they will never be able to run 100 meters in four seconds. This is impossible. Humans just can't do that, no matter how thin. <laughs> <It's just laughs> like and so I get frustrated a little bit sometimes. Like, oh, come on, you know, my hands, even though I try to maintain my hands, I, I have my limits. I, I, because this, there's no limit. Right. With the students, it comes down to what I just talked about. If they skip the analysis, the, all mm. the analysis, and then they skip the exploration, any of these, I get frustrated. Mm -hmm. You can't skip. You can't skip from like the first, like I'll get the music or I'm gonna go straight to the third, start practicing, and then play. And then I ask, what's the title? What does the title mean? And then you can't answer that question. I would be so, or this, you, you're playing in an excerpt, you know, What's the tempo? And then they go, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> really? Wow. How do you expect a conductor to conduct something if they don't know the tempo? You have to have, you have to know. You just have to know. And so if we, when they skip any of these stages, it drives me bonkers. Crazy. Because <laughs> yes. it's like, <clears throat> isn't that something that you should uh, have researched or know? or figure it out, and if they answer, if they can answer all those questions, and then the answer is like, I just, my hands just can't do it yet. I get it. It takes time. I get it. You did all the work, I get it. It will take time, and I'm with you on that. But if you skip any of those stages, not good. Well, it's like an athlete that skips the workouts. Ha, exactly. You know, it's like the athlete rest, you know. There they just want to go to the to the game, you know, or to- You want to be able to shoot really well? Yeah. So practice. And then there's different kinds of practice. You can practice physically, you know, you can practice mentally, visualizing it. And people said that that actually work quite well as well, mm -hmm. just like music. Yeah, absolutely. Do you, uh, we have another question sort of in that same realm, Theodore, uh, Theodore says, how do you deal with, and possibly do you have stage fear? Do you ever have stage fright or, also, if you don't really battle that, I'm sure you've had those discussions with your students. Maybe speak to a few strategies on sort of stage fright or 
fear of failing or I'm happy to. Um, the truth is, I only get nervous, only get nervous if I knew I didn't do everything I could to prepare it 100%. Because I have to look in the mirror of myself and like, you didn't do everything you could to prepare that. So I, I deserve to be nervous. Mm -hmm. And that's not a nice feeling. If I skip any of those five, I am not prepared. If I did all that, I, at least I know. But just before I get on stage, you know, I did everything I could. I know, I know every gesture. I know how I want to play every note. Now I'm going to go execute it. Then there's no, to me, Personally, I, I don't mm -hmm. get nervous if I'm extremely prepared. And I use that as a percentage sometimes. It's like, are you 98% prepared? Are you 92% prepared? Are you 50% prepared? If my student says, I I'm 50% prepared. No wonder you're nervous. You should be. <laughs> you're right, you should be. Because you're rolling the dice. You know, you know what's going to happen. You, some crazy thing is going to happen. It's going to... It's gonna, you don't explode <laughs> because you your inside your heart rate is going like because you know that you know I didn't practice that passage. I never could play that in the practice room. So how do you expect yourself to execute that in front of other people? You can't, <laughs> right? So of right. course you will get nervous. And so my my recommendation is to do all these. The stages I just talked about, this came in handy. I'm glad I talked about it. Yeah. But the fifth one, to, to particularly uh, be specific about this performing, performance anxiety issues, if you never perform in front of people, and that's your first time, it's like something you you never experienced, right? You, you, that's like your first experience, and it could go either way because you never realized that your heart could pound that fast. Mm -hmm. And then you were thinking about, you know, that person I really like is here. Oh, my goodness, you know. <laughs> I'm trying to prove and trying to play as well as whatever. And, and um, so the last stage requires you perform, practicing performing, mm -hmm. practicing execution. You have mock auditions. You play for people. I, I mean, when I, I mean, I will confess, um, when I was going through all the competitions, don't laugh, Julie, don't laugh. <laughs> I would put on a certain time, I would put on my shoes and I would come into the door, close the door to the practice room. And then I would, um, I would play what I need to play. And then I will take a bow. I will practice that too. I mean, I, I practice to the wall, but, and then I right. play for my friends, I play for people that I it make me nervous because I respect them so much. You know, those things are really great because you cannot be a performance major or want to have something to do with performance and then don't perform very frequently. It's impossible, impossible. It's like, I want to be a really good cyclist, but I only, you know, bike like once a, Three months. Ha, ha, what? Right. And I only use my stationary bike at home. <laughs> so if you perform for a lot of people all the time and make that as your routine, part of the act, uh, part of the things that you do, do in the execution side, that category, that, that ought to help. And in the Absolutely. end, in the end, you can only play like you. Not faster, not like so-and-so. Not slower, not more beautiful, whatever. You can only play like you. So if you want the results here, this has to equal your training. You have to value excellence, right? And you have to value, if you value excellence, you have to value training. Your training has to be equal to that. You want to play that note like that every single time? You practice like that every single time. Second time. The third time, the fourth time, exactly like that. And then if you, in the end, 
There will be always people that don't like the way you play. I don't know about that. I don't know if I agree. You know, so be it. It's a big, yeah, I think that's, a yeah, that's world. definitely, well, it is a big world. And I think that's a challenge right now is because of the internet and access to seeing performers from all over the world, students are uh, comparing themselves constantly. And so that could generate kind of that stage anxiety as well. Like I'm not as good as this person or I'm not as good as this person. Uh, so no, that's great. Great advice, she. Thanks so much. I think, um, uh, I think in the end, they can only, <clears throat> can only take care of like our part. Right. How they look at you, how they evaluate you, you, you can't, can't control. It's out of your control. Sure. But you can control what you can control. Yeah. Yeah, one of my uh, favorite authors is coach John Wooden. And uh, he talks about to uh, combat uh, stage anxiety or game anxiety or whatever. It, it's preparedness. Preparedness combats anxiety. So uh, very similar to your answer as well. So <laughs> this, this brought, Hold on. This brought me to a, a story, a quick story. It's when I was teaching at Rutgers, there was a, a Vivian Stringer, the uh, women's basketball all coach a very famous one she happened to be there and so one of her assistant coaches uh, contacted me me i'm five two okay wow. all right yeah she contacted me to to go to the women's basketball locker room to have an inspirational talk with them and i was thinking well what do i have to offer them you know i was just like ah, oh well i'll just be me so i go there and we talk you know what's amazing Number one, the club room is amazing. It doesn't look any like anything like what you see out from outside. Well, it's, it's beautiful. But what's the, the questions that they, they, they asked? It's the same question as my students. They're basketball players and then they're the musicians. They're so yeah. similar. They were, so, so many they were parallels. Asking questions, they were asking questions. It's like, how, do you get nervous? It's the same. Like, how do you conquer the anxiety? You know, I got to put it in. I, I got to put it in. How do you, do, do you, do you feel the same way? I was like, I know exactly what you mean. I can help you. And we talked about that strategy that, that I could do that. And some of them said, the coach said we have to practice at least four to six hours a day just to per like practice, individual practice. And I said, man, that's easy. Because I asked yeah. my students to practice eight to ten hours a day. So you get off easy. Anyway, it's very simple. That's hilarious. Yeah, so many parallels, definitely. Um, I was an athlete in high school, so I've, I studied a lot of coaches' books, and um, a lot of coaches were a big influence on me too, but so many parallels. Um, hey, so she, we've got just a – we'll probably start wrapping it up here in a few minutes, but there are two more questions that I think I'll, I'll throw your way. Um, that are kind of relative to where we're at right now uh, with our sheltering. And um, Nico asked, uh, my guess is that chamber music will be a big part of music in the near future. Do you have any plans to compose for percussion or other instruments mixed ensembles? I, I would assume during this time. Any thoughts on that? And I do. I do. And that might be a two-part question. I was going to ask you, what are some new projects that you might have in the works? Ah, okay, I'll answer that. Yeah. Uh, Nico, you're right. I think the chamber music is going to take um, uh, take on a perhaps bigger ratio of uh, live music, only because for the next few months, at least, because of the social distance uh, requirements and uh, the safety for other musicians. Um, I was involved in a meeting talking about how really, what is the appropriate distance between a brass player or brass players and wind players? Do they have to be on the second floor, you know, on the balcony? Anyway, um, this kind of discussion is everywhere um, globally right now. And I do believe that chamber music will probably come in in a, in a slightly, at, at least the beginning portion of our reopening, um, will take on more responsibility of presenting music. Um, I do have plans to write. I, I took a little, a little, a bit, little bit of time off uh, from practicing only because 
I, I said that already. I, I was sort of in shock and had to get myself sort of in a, in a place that I could finally sort of gather and regain my creativity, believe mm -hmm. it or not. Um, but I do have plans to write, compose. Um, one of the projects, <laughs> you're going to laugh. <laughs> one, I, I've written a syndrome solo called The Monologue for Tom Sherwood for the 10th uh, anniversary for the modern snare drum competition and this is going to be a sort of like a sequel to that i don't know the title nice. yet because i don't really want it to be um too, too much you know covid-19 related stuff right. it is we are in isolation and it is somewhat in a, in a way as a monologue again but um i don't think title would be like that anyway this would be a snare drum solo that i would I would like to write for Chris Lamb, one of my nice. best friends. Um, so I do have plan to write that. And another one is um, Lalo Davila, your Davila. husband, and I are both going to be in charge of uh, directing the TMEA All Honors Honors Percussion Ensemble, which I'm very excited about. It's next February. Hopefully, we'll be sort of back to be some quasi so. um i i am gonna write a piece for that group because nice. i have a I have a deep connection with texas and percussionists in texas in general i lived there for six years um and i am gonna write a piece for that group and although it's going to be very difficult to gauge how difficult to write this piece because um you have 16 players, and they're like top, 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 top players in Texas. Mm -hmm. But we only have two and a half days to rehearse, so I I have to uh, I have to think about how gonna how am I gonna do that. But I'm excited about it. I I take that as a challenge, and that's great. Hopefully, hopefully I can write a good one that I could dedicate to all the all my Texas friends. Well, I hope that's that. That's so exciting for the students to think, you know. So all you Texas students that are out there that are trying out for Allstate next year, uh, if you make this it's ensemble, not, and you can not, premiere one of she's <laughs> she's work, and it's the inaugural event of this T Texas percussion ensemble, right? This is the inaugural year, I believe, for that. So and, super and I'm not, and we're not only just playing my piece. Uh, I've commissioned a Finnish. American composer Tim Furchin to write a piece for that group too. So it would be two premieres, oral premieres. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Fantastic. That's exciting. Um, all right, why don't we wrap it up with kind of a, a one last question and then we can kind of segue into the, the end here. It's just been so, such a great hour of uh, wisdom and sharing she and your energy. I always love your energy you bring to the table. Uh, Justin uh, asks, what are your suggestions for staying in shape during our long off season right now? A couple of people have uh, written in some questions very similar to that. Like, what can we be doing right now during this season? I know we talked about, you know, students probably have limited access to things like timpani, maybe a marimba. So we talked about floor exercises, but maybe just a few other uh, ideas that you might have to share with the listeners here, the viewers? Um, great question, Justin. We will be back. You know that. And, and I, I think we need to know that. We'll be back. I don't know what kind of platform. Um, the world that we come back to, I, it will be slightly different than, than a few months ago, but we will be back. It's... If, after the depression, uh, Spanish flu, all that, H human beings somehow get back together, they unite. And just think about all the people they're giving themselves uh, to our society. I, I can't get over it. Like 95, uh, 100 people, doctors and nurses, like would just volunteer and they would go to New York with Epic Center where everybody's trying to get out. They go in. It's like, right. it's very inspiring. And so we have to believe, we have to do our part, but we have to believe it will be back. Now, here are my suggestions. Get your pencils. 
<laughs> I don't know about that. One, you have to be ready. Boom. Do not come back when we're like, okay, here we can all play concerts now. Oh, I haven't been practicing. What? You have all this time, right? If you're thinking about, you know, I, I want to, I've always want to learn that piece. I always want to, you know, give a recital with a, a flute player. I always want to do this. Always, here's your time. Here's your periods, here's your period of time to really focus on doing that. Whatever your to-do list musically or technically, mm -hmm. this is the time to tackle them. And so some of the students, you know, are slightly upset and depressed about all the auditions for orchestra are postponed and canceled, which you understand. Everybody understands that in the world. And my, my take on that is, ah. Oh, Thank goodness. I buy myself <laughs> time to listen to all the repertoire, listen to different kind of orchestras and compare different styles and interpretations and then look at the part and really analyze it and listen and, and practice in a way that is efficient and musical and meaningful. And so you, you can literally practically just start practicing like 12 hours a day and then every day until you're ready. So my suggestion is like, Get ready, because we're going to come back, and we're going to come back, and you're going to be ready. Stronger. Come back stronger. And if you don't have any instruments, this is, this is my suggestion. You can really mem try to see if you can do this. You can practice away from the instruments, which I recommend all the time. I practice on the bed just because I, I was always traveling and, and stay in the hotel. So I practice on the bed because I can't play on the carpet because downstairs, you know, people might... Might be upset. So I practice on the bed. You could too. Get your hands ready. You can practice by phrase and just practice on the bed, but make every note on your bed sound great. Mm. Like sound like something. So when you actually the day that you're allowed to go back to school and you oh man, I memorize this piece. I practice this piece so much over the last two months. I can't wait to put it on the instrument and see what it sounds like. See if you will match how I imagine. Oh, that's so exciting. Super, super exciting. Or take on a crazy piece that does not use any of those instruments, the body percussions, mm -hmm. the crowd, you know, with a drum, but anything, right? With the kalimba. I mean, seriously, just do something that you haven't done. So, so to sort of learn something else, I mean, you don't, you don't need to feel pressure to learn another language. Like a lot of people are doing that. Oh, this is the time to learn another language. I think it takes more than a pandemic to learn a language, <laughs> but in my opinion. But what I'm trying to say is like, take this in as an opportunity and get ready because we will be back. Strong. And scene. That's a great way to, to end on. Wow. How about it, everybody? Shi Yi Wu here with us today. And uh, thank you so much, Shi Yi. Um, really, really appreciate your, your love, your energy, and your sharing uh, to our percussion thank for, community. Uh, thank you for putting up with me. And, uh, of course. I, I, and, and thanks to Percussive Raw Society, our only community that we should treasure and support uh, for hosting. Awesome. awesome. Everybody. To see. Yeah. Well, and, and that just brings me to, uh, I wanted to, again, thank everybody online here for joining us for PAS Presents. Um, if you're looking for more resources, make sure to join, rejoin, or renew your PAS membership. I will say, guys, PAS is working incredibly hard right now. All the staff, board of directors, everybody, um, probably working twice as hard uh, to just make good decisions and planning, and um, they're there for you. So if your membership needs to be renewed, this would be a great time to support Professor Arts Society. Yesterday was Tuesday Giving. Uh, so if you didn't get a chance uh, to give to PIS, anything helps. The price of a Starbucks cup of coffee, uh, whatever you'd like to donate for PIS. Uh, so Because we're going to be here. PIS is going to be here. Um, we're going to get through this. So... Uh, if you're looking for more resources, uh, PAS.org is our website. Make sure to check that out. And uh, uh, there's many more webinars and uh, interviews and Friday Fundamentals. In fact, I'm doing the Friday Fundamental this, this Friday on some snare drum and some stick control. 
So uh, yeah, looking forward to it. Um, but thank you all so much for joining. Thanks for all your kind remarks that I'm seeing coming in right now. Thanks to Joshua and the whole staff at PIS and, and everybody stay safe out there. Let's all do our part. All right, take care. Thanks, she. Take care.